Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Best Abilities. It's a series where I look at a class of champions and decide which of them has the best passive, Q, W, E, and ultimate. We started off with fighters, and now we're moving into the mage class. This is going to be both fun and challenging to make in light of mages being divided into three subclasses, but it also means there's a lot to choose from, so I hope you're excited for this one. For those who haven't seen the first episode, which I recommend you do after watching this one, let me establish the rules for this series. I'm going to be evaluating each ability in a vacuum, so if I were to talk about, say, Annie's Tibbers, it will come without the stun since that's on her passive. That said, resource-based mechanics such as mana and energy costs will be a part of it. I'm also going to judge them based on their overall usefulness. Abilities that are really strong but only in very select situations will, for the most part, be disregarded. Otherwise, you could make a case for any ability being good, as the number of objectively useless abilities are few and far between. Finally, we're going to assume the theoretical champion is going to be part of the same class of champions. So for this episode, we're making a hypothetical mage, and therefore we'll only be comparing abilities to other members of that class. In other words, no comparison between mages and fighters, only mages to mages. In light of last episode's introduction taking way too long, we're gonna just dive straight into this one. But if you're still confused as to how the series works, check out the first episode, I explain the rules in more detail there. Alrighty, so passive abilities for mages are more uniform than that of other classes despite being the only one with three subcategories, and it's mostly due in part to all of them having more or less the same neutral game at the end of the day. Almost all mages are ranged, and therefore their passives are designed with that in mind. Even so, it was pretty easy for me to find the top three because some of these would be straight up unfair if you could attach them to anyone else. Seraphine, Annie, and Vex. Stage presence is two components, but the only one we really care about is Echo. After casting two basic abilities, your third one will double cast at no cost right after the other. So for instance, you can double cast two Xerath lasers, two Victor Death Rays, two, uh, I don't know, Lux Roots, two of any Qs, Ws, or Es, which would be quite broken for a lot of champions because that would help so much for burst damage or even wave clear depending on what stage of the game you're at. Harmony is also a decent bonus to have because it extends her attack range in lane and causes her attacks to do bonus damage if you space out your abilities properly. Unfortunately, I would argue stage presence is a lot better if it was on another class like a marksman or assassin, but we're only viewing these moves in the confines of the mage class. Extremely broken nonetheless. Annie's Pyromania is a classic. Much like stage presence, it requires a certain number of abilities to be used before activating, but once it does, the next damaging ability inflicts a long-lasting stun, and what holds this passive back is that Annie has relatively long cooldowns and middling range. Tag this on someone who can cast a lot of abilities in quick succession such as Karthus, Cassiopeia, or Rice, and it would amplify their threat capacity to an absurd level. Even for non-spammy mages, a 1 and 3 quarter second stun in the late game on any of their damaging abilities makes them a force to be reckoned with. If by chance they have built-in lockdown already, such as Lux, we could easily see 3 to 4 second immobilizations. On the subject of lockdown, Vex's Doom and Gloom is next. It shares a lot of the same functionality with Annie's Pyromania, but isn't strictly better or worse. I'd argue the extra bonus damage from Gloom helps a lot for any mage's damage, and the fact that Doom can be primed just by waiting a set amount of time as opposed to spamming abilities makes it harder to see coming. Honorable mentions go to Lissandra and Karthus. Iceborne Subjugation is notoriously deadly in team fights as it basically allows you to turn enemy takedowns into Kogma passes that slow enemies nearby, making further takedowns much easier. There's a ton of power within Lissandra's passive. Karthus' is Death Defied is one of those only balanced because it's on that champion abilities. I don't think anyone will want to have to deal with any other mage who can free fire on you for 7 seconds. Like fighters and most other champions, Q is their main source of damage. They usually have low cooldowns and average to below average mana costs, making it a case of personal preference. And so I elected to choose Talia, Zerath, and Zoe. Threaded Volley comes with its fair share of limitations, but the damage output is no short of exceptional. At level 5, it's a 3 second cooldown with a target range of 1000, and if all shots connect onto a single champion, we're talking 510 base plus 135% AP. Now, if we were to synergize this with either Pyromania or Doom and Gloom, that makes it a guarantee. It is a shame that Threaded Volley doesn't get a whole lot of mileage out of stage presence because of Word Ground, but if you were taking Tully's Q, you would very much rather have any or Vex passive anyway. Arcano Pulse is the most consistent of the long-range projectile-based attacks. It does carry an exorbitant mana cost that's really only alleviated by Zerath's mana surge, but that doesn't detract from its status as one of the strongest abilities in the neutral game. 1450 max range, solid base damage and scaling, and a relatively low cooldown. Safe damage is very good to have for a mage. 
Now all we need is a burst option, and I would choose Zoe's Paddle Star. Figuring out how to maximize the range and damage of it will demand specific abilities to be used in conjunction, but even normally, it's a fantastic ability. Since Paddle Star is really Zoe's only consistent damaging ability, they funneled almost all of her power budget into it. So if we were to take it out of her and put it on someone else, that's all the strengths of a one-hit wonder without the weaknesses. Honorable mentions go to Vladimir and Lux. Mages have little to no sustain in lane. Couple this with their finite amount of resources, and eventually they will have to base to refuel. Vladimir doesn't really have to. Transfusion is a mid-range point-and-click attack that can keep you topped off almost indefinitely. But if you want some hard crowd control, you can tack on Light Binding instead. It does a respectable amount of damage and roots up to two targets for two seconds. Never a bad thing. W is where things really get interesting, as mages have quite possibly the largest variety of purpose in their abilities. And in all honesty, I would add like 3 more if I didn't limit myself to just 5. But I decided to pick Twisted Fate, LeBlanc, and Zoe. All things considered, pick a card is a one-stop shop. Blue card gives you infinite mana sustain and solid damage, red card is AoE for wave clear, and gold card is a point and click stun. I'd actually argue that pick a card is in the top 10 best Ws in the entire game. Where else can you get an easily accessible ranged point and click 2 second stun? Nowhere. And on top of that, it also comes with red and blue cards so you have different options to choose from. There are so many mages who would want this. Or rather, every mage would want this. Now earlier, I talked about how Zoe's Paddle Star requires very specific abilities to be comfortably used to its fullest effect. And since we're obviously not choosing Portal Jump for best ultimate, LeBlanc's Distortion comes very close. Distortion is a free target dash and optional return blink that comes with impact damage. Despite being a burst mage, LeBlanc has unusually good mobility, and poor mobility is often what keeps mages in check. I would say Distortion would have been better universally if it was on her E, because there are a few mages whose W is their most important setup tool, such as Lissandra, Vex, or the aforementioned Twisted Fate. But then again, I would shudder to think of a timeline where a champion had LeBlanc's W and Twisted Fate's W in one kit. That's like a 1200 range point and click gold card. Last but not least, we have Zoe's Spell Thief, Summoner Spells, and Item Actives galore. As long as you have Spell Shards to pick up, you can get free damage, free flashes, free teleports, free anything. There are instances where consistency can get in the way, but more often than not, Spell Thief comes through for Zoe players then disappoints them, so I'd imagine it applies to the rest of the cast as well. Honorable mentions go to Vladimir and Cassiopeia. A Sanguine Pool is 2 seconds of untarget ability, allowing you to dodge any significant attack or multiple if used correctly. And unlike other untarget ability spells, it lasts long enough to where you can reposition yourself more favorably. It is a very useful defensive tool. As for Cassiopeia, Miasma is just broken. It covers such a large area with an incredibly powerful slow at higher ranks, and anyone trapped in it can't use flash, blinks, or any dash type abilities or even items. Despite her Q and ultimate, Cassiopeia can only really DPS one target at a time, so she's weak in 2v1s. Now imagine if you gave Miasma to someone like Anivia, they would have to sit in a glacial storm with no chance to escape. Cassio's W is situationally overpowered. Similarly to W, mages have a large assortment of ease. It can come in the form of damage, crowd control, utility spells, and so on, albeit not to the same extent as the W category. With that in mind, I opted for Lissandra, Vagar, and Zoe again. Okay, given that I included Zoe in all three basic abilities, you might get the impression that she's one of the best champions. Allow me to clarify something really quick. This series assumes you're taking their abilities out of the original champion and placing it in a vacuum. Zoe's abilities individually are all extremely powerful, but collectively not the most optimal. It's just that her attacks have such good potential synergy with other mage abilities. Anyways, moving on. Lissandra's Glacial Path is a very versatile ability. On its own, it does magic damage to all enemies in a straight line with a max range of 1025. The player can then choose to blink to wherever the claw is. Optional mobilities such as LeBlanc, Zed, and Lissandra are valuable assets to have on any champion because it allows them to mix up their opponents. When chasing LeBlanc, the pursuer has to figure out if she's gonna blink back to her return point or stay where she is. Same goes for Liss. While you see the claw traveling, it's effectively a zoning tool since you have to be wary of the fact that she can teleport to it at a moment's notice. Once again, mages have poor mobility. This would mitigate that weakness for many. Vagar's Event Horizon is by all accounts one of the most broken abilities in the game period. It's a large cage that stuns anyone who touches a perimeter for over 2 seconds, and unlike other cages or terrain, you can't dash over it since it knocks you down. Unless you have either a blink, spell shield, or on target ability, you're stuck in that cage whether you like it or not, and that makes setting up a lot of other plays really easy. Vagar Cage into Anivia Storm, or Vagar Cage plus Victor Gravity Field, Vagar Cage plus Rumble Ultimate. This ability is made intentionally overtuned because it's on Vagar. Although, I think if you're going with any of X passive, then this is excessive. 
Zoe's Sleepy Trouble Bubble is the best long range setup tool out of all the Meijis. We do have Nico, Ari, LeBlanc, Swain, and such, but Zoe's Bubble has so much potential range and damage amplification that you can pull off a lot of easy combos with different attacks. You could be that one guy who takes Zoe Bubble, Lux Root, TF Gold Card, and Everfrost, and have a literal 8 second chain CC. Before you say that's a mean strategy because it does no damage, think again. TF Gold Card with Lich Bane hurts like a truck. Lux Root and Zoe Bubble also hurt. Best part is, because it lasts so long, you could throw Zoe Bubble from a far distance, then casually walk up to layer any other crowd control you have. Honorable mentions go to Lux and Nico. Loose and Singularity is a very respectable long-range area explosion that can double as a scouting and zoning tool thanks to its ability to grant sight and last for up to 5 seconds, all around a solid attack for any mage to have, whether burst or artillery. Then there's Nico's Tangle Bars, not the most consistent route in the game, but if you manage to tag multiple opponents with it, you're staring down an AoE Morgana Q which could clutch a lot of teamfights. And now we arrive at the ultimates. This was hard. Mage ultimates are among the most explosive in the game. They typically have the highest combination of area coverage and damage as one would expect from their archetype. In all honesty, you can make a case for every single mage ultimate since they all have their uses. Maybe in a given scenario, Ryze's Realm Warp would do wonders for a hypothetical champion. But I think these three take the cake, at least for me. Rumble, LeBlanc, and Seraphine. Rumble's Equalizer was on my Super Ultimates video, and it's no surprise why. It has a target range of 1700, and since it's a directional angle ability, you can get a potential max cast range of over 2800, putting it just under the cusp of semi-global ultimate territory. It covers a very large area and dishes out an astonishing amount of damage, far more than even his own peers in ideal conditions. In a similar fashion to a lot of other abilities, the Equalizer is balanced by the fact that Rumble has no personal lockdown to speak of. If by chance he traded out Electro Harpoon for Vagar's Event Horizon or Scrap Shield for Pick a Card, he could essentially guarantee a big chunk of vault damage on anyone he chooses, maybe even more. It's one of the ultimates that benefits the most from this kind of thought experiment. LeBlanc's Mimic is by all accounts stage presence on demand. I mean, you could technically have both Seraphine's passive and LeBlanc ultimate if you wanted, in which case you could use W, Q, or E three times in one sitting, and the amount of BS that entails, I don't even want to begin to fathom. It's an interesting concept. Ordinarily, your ultimate is supposed to be your strongest ability, something the opposing team should watch out for. But there are certain champions who would love to be able to reuse a basic ability multiple times. We can't exactly quantify just how good LeBlanc's Mimic is when we think of the however many hundreds of Qs, Ws, and Es there are. Seraphine's Encore takes the last spot. Out of all the teamfight wombo combo ultimates among mages, I'd argue this is the best one. Namely, in that it's the easiest to land. Yes, there's Nico Pop Blossom, Orianna's Command Shockwave, Annie's Tibbers, Vex's Shadow Surge, but those all need something else with it. Encore not only has a long cast range and lockdown duration, but it can extend its range indefinitely for every champion struck, ally, or enemy, and is a super ultimate just like Rumble's Equalizer, but for different reasons. Honorable mentions go to Karthus and Nivea. Requiem is a no-brainer. Objectively speaking, Karthus has a rather weak base kit out of consideration for his ultimate, but we could take Requiem and give it to a mage with actual strong basic abilities like the ones in this video, and that could change everything. The main downside to the salt is that it doesn't really synergize with anything, but it doesn't have to. You just press the button and everyone on the enemy team takes damage. Easy way to back up your teammates regardless of position or to snipe out low health stragglers. For Anivia's Glacial Storm, I kind of already gave away why it's so good. If you could create situations where escaping out of it is impossible such as Vagar's Cage, this ultimate would be turbo broken. So it's one of those abilities that benefit the most from this type of theory crafting. Now as mentioned before, you can argue a lot of mage ultimates are the best. Malzahar, Zareth, Lissandra, Vagar, Twist of Fate, so on and so forth. But that defeats the purpose of talking about the best. Anyways, that's gonna be it for today. Let me know your own list in the comments down below if you disagree with my choices. But if you enjoyed the video, it would be awesome if you left a like and sub to the channel. Also, consider following me on Twitter, joining my Discord server, and checking out my previous episode on Fighters if you haven't yet. Until next time though, thanks so much for watching, and I look forward to seeing you again soon. Take care.